Um, today's colloquium speaker will be our very own Gustavo Torrens, along with his co-author, Evan Lopez Cruz. Um, I'm really excited. This is a super fascinating question, formal model. I'm looking Let's forward see. to that. <laughs> um, I, I'm not gonna say too much more um, other than I will keep the cue. Just look over at me, raise your hand, I will write down. I'll also keep a look online. Um, regular questions, or regular rules apply, right? Clarifying questions in the midst, but please hold other more aggressive questioning until the end. Um, and uh, 15, 20 minutes, right? All right, awesome, welcome. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, although I'm every Monday here. <laughs> Okay, a little bit of um, history of why I'm presenting this. So it's, um, it was an empty spot in the colloquium series. Um, Chess and I started fighting for that spot. At some point, they proposed a duel. Um, we have lawyers in the Austin workshop. They, they advise us there are some legal constraints on duels, but the logistic problem was the key. Um, they are rebuilding the porch, so we couldn't come up with a duel. So um, we ended up with democracy to solve this issue. So we sent an email to every uh, well, 100 persons affiliated to the Austrian workshop <laughs> to ask nasty questions to Gustavo or Jess. That's the final thing, 99 Gustavo, one Jess, I voted for Jess. So, um, okay, so it's, um, we're really working on this paper, rewriting this paper. So you, I don't think that you're going to be disappointed. Plenty of opportunities for nasty questions. So it's payback time for me that I'm always asking a lot of questions in the Colorado series, okay? So um, about this project, so it's a joint project with Ivan Lopez Cruz. Uh, um, Ivan, uh, he was a fellow at the Austrian workshop uh, when he was a grad student in the econ department here at IU. And he's going to visiting us uh, in the, at the beginning of the spring semester. I will mention some stuff about uh, Ivan at the end of the presentation because I think that people could take advantage of some of his of his awesome skills uh, while he's on, on, on campus, okay? Uh, specifically about this paper. So what is this paper about? So essentially this paper is about the relationship between uh, international trade, trade policy, in particular trade restrictions and conflict. It's mainly a theoretical piece, but as you see, um, colonial history, classical colonial history is there at the background as the key motivation for the, for the paper. So uh, essentially we're interested in explaining some basic historical patterns using modern uh, theoretical tools, but we are not only interested in history, we are also interested in kind of unraveling some of these general mechanisms behind uh, inefficient outcomes. So it's, it's both, it's in the middle be between understanding history and uh, talking about some uh, general mechanisms behind efficiency, that's where the paper is uh, place, okay? So let me briefly start with uh, uh, describing what I think is the existing uh, literature on uh, international trade and conflict, um, mainly with, maybe within economics of conflict, but also a little bit in uh, political science, in particular in, in international relations, okay? So one way of, in which you can think about uh, international trade and conflict it's essentially a version of the natural resource course, okay? So the idea is that if you are fighting for a resource, uh, if you're expecting that they're going to be trade, that resource is more valuable, okay? So if you are planning to only use that resource for you, uh, the resource is less valuable. As a consequence, that disputed resource that you expect to trade is more valuable. This induces more investment in arming and worse outcomes. So this is a version of the natural resource first. So that's one, uh, one uh, mechanism that the theory has, uh, has explored. The second mechanism works through factor price equalization. The classical idea that as you trade, the prices of the goods converge across countries, but also the, fact, the uh, prices of the factors of production, this generates some kind of leveling the playing field effect, and that essentially um, tends to produce uh, that favor arm races, okay? So these are mechanisms that have been explored. I'm citing some, some uh, papers there. The third possible um, theoretical uh, idea is that uh, 
international trade has a prof, uh, propice effect. Essentially, the idea is if you trade a lot with another country or another unit, then you don't want to destroy those gains from trade. And as a consequence, you tend to uh, engage less in, in, in open conflict, okay? So the main problem that I see in these three um, uh, versions of the connection between international trade and conflicts that they cannot explain the coexistence of trade restrictions and conflict, okay? They're more about what trade opening or increases in trade generates on conflict, but they cannot explain the connection between uh, trade barriers imposed by, by the countries and conflict. And then we have colonial history there as a key example in which there is coexistence of mercantilist policies and colonial wars for at the very least 300 years, okay? So in some sense, we cannot use this existing theory to explain the experience during uh, classical colonial times. So essentially, what do we do in this paper? Essentially, what we present is a very simple model. Um, I would say that we try to strip this uh, theory to bare bones. And essentially, what we have is three countries, two metropolis, that are fighting for the control of economy. It's very simple. Um, the economy is a Ricardian economy. So it's a textbook economy that we teach in basic international uh, economic classes. And there are three commodities, and each country has uh, essentially comparative advantage in one, one commodity. So you cannot go simpler in terms of the economic model. And then in terms of what the metropolis can do to the colony, it's also very limited. You, you cannot directly extract resources, for example. Uh, you cannot ens enslave the population of the colony. So we rule out all those things. Um, the only thing that the metropolis can do is to pick the trade policy of the colony. So essentially, that's the only variable that we are allowing the metropolis to do to the colony. And essentially, what we consider is three possible trade regimes that are generated because of this. So one is that the metropolis decides to do not impose any trade restrictions on the colony, and we end up in free trade between the three countries, the two metropolises and the colony. Uh, the other option is what we call weak mercantilism, and it's essentially that the, the colony, the metropolis that controls the colony, does not allow the colony to trade with its rival, but the metropolis that is control over the colony still trades with its rival. So it's, a, it's some restrictions on, on trade floats, but it's not like full restrictions on trade floats. And then the other possibility is what we call strong mercantilism. Essentially, you build the empire. So within the winning metropolis and the colony, there is pure free trade, but there is no trade floats allowed with the other metropolis. That's even stronger trade restrictions than with mercantilism. And then the game is very simple. Those metropolis is investing guns, there is war, and the winner selects the trade regimes. Essentially, it's selecting the trade policy of the colony, and then countries produce some trade according to the trade regime. It's extremely simple. Uh, <laughs> so what is the main result? So um, we show that the winner has incentives to impose a tra trade restrictions to the colony. Uh, these restrictions are mainly mercantilist policies that restrict the trade flows between the colony and the other metropoly. And what's the logic? The logic is that the metropolis that takes control of the colony essentially gains from manipulating the terms of trade. Essentially, you don't allow the colony to sell to the other rival, and as a consequence, that uh, improves your terms of trade. So it's a terms of trade monopoly power mechanism that is the uh, uh, that is uh, working here. Um, weak mercantilism tends to be very attractive for the metropolis that wins, uh, essentially because you uh, improve your terms of trade with respect to the colony, but you do not completely destroy gains from trade with your rival colony, with your rival metropolis, okay? On top of that, losing, if you are the loser in this colonial world, is very costly because essentially what you suffer is some exclusion from colonial trade, and that is extremely costly for you. So essentially, the metropolis they have serious incentives to invest in arming and fight. Because if you are the winner, you gain the right to impose uh, um, a trade policy that will improve your terms of trade. But if you are the loser, you are going to be excluded from uh, some colonial trade, which is costly. 
So for both reasons, you have incentives to fight to win the control of the colony. So how do we use this basic model to explain a colonial uh, tradition, classical colonial history? Well, I think if you focus on these 300 years that we consider uh, the, the uh, kind of the, our target uh, for, for this paper, essentially what you observe is huge expansion of economic trade, right, starting from the beginning of the 16th century, huge proliferations of mercantilist policies across, across the, the, the globe, and colonial wars. If you have to describe what is this period about, it's mainly about these three things, okay? So the problem is that the existing theory cannot explain those things, okay? Um, uh, well, what we are saying is that we can, okay? So how can we explain those three things with our model? Well, essentially what, uh, what we claim is that those innovations in navigation reduce the transport cost and open the door for colonization of America, Asia, and, and us in Asia. So trade expanded as a consequence, but essentially those new trade connections were essentially captured as colonies in most cases. So the winner of those, uh, of those, uh, of those processes imposed mercantilist policies in order to improve their terms of trade. And of course, the other, metropo the other metropolis, the other European countries, they were, they were fighting for those rights. So that explains the colonial wars. So essentially the model essentially give you a very intuitive, if you want, explanation of the three main features that characterize the colonial period, expansion of trade, proliferation of trade restrictions and colonial wars. And think in the following way, if you consider any type of traditional theory, they cannot explain these things. Imagine, for example, if you go and talk with a trade economist about expansion of trade, usually it's associated with trade liberalization. Okay, some reductions of trade barriers that expands trade. And usually war is associated with what? Reduction of trade flows because war interferes with trade flows, okay? So most of the standard theories, the ones that I describe, or even others that do not explicitly think about this, but implicitly you may think that they are telling you something about this, uh, they cannot explain these uh, uh, three patterns, okay? While our theory can explain these three patterns. So um, the other thing I would like to uh, discuss is uh, the connection with theory, okay? So how we, our paper is connected with, um, with theory? Well, first of all, um, essentially we are um, considering the connection between two sources of inefficiencies, okay? So the first one is something relatively well known is this idea that um, it's a rent seeking idea if you uh, invest in order to win a contestable resource, essentially all those um, uh, investments in guns, they are a pure waste from the, from the economic point of view. So individually rational, but not good at the, at the aggregate level. And on top of that, you can add the destruction associated with war, which we did not, but it's very easy to include in our, in our framework, okay? The second, the second distortion here is the trade distortion. Because in our model, the best thing that you can do in order to maximize global output is free trade, but in equilibrium, what you have is trade distortions. So there are two sources of, uh, uh, of inefficiency in our equilibrium. It's trade distortions and uh, rent-seeking investments in arms and war, okay? Um, again, we're not saying we are the first one to talk about these inefficiencies, but I think what we are doing is the first one to establish a very interesting connection between the two, okay? So essentially what we are saying is that this is the worst type of competition. So essentially you are fighting for the right to control or monopolize a market. So essentially it's not rent seeking for a resource, but then exposed, you have good incentive to invest and trade this resort, is rent seeking for the right to impose a market distortion, which essentially give you the worst possible a scenario in terms of inefficiency, okay? Um, if you compare this with the standard literature on rent seeking, this is very different because in the standard literature of rent seeking is the resort is given and then the, only you have this inefficiency related to rent, to investment in guns to conquer the resource or 
The second inefficiency, it's defined by the government, okay? So the government, for example, say there are some trade restrictions and then there is lobby or corruption to uh, get those trade restrictions by companies. But the inefficiency, the first inefficiency associated with those trade restrictions is imposed by the government and then those rights are sold among companies, of course, in an illegal way through corruption. Here it's very different because the same players that are fighting to gain control are the ones that expose, they have incentive to uh, generate this second source of inefficiency, are the ones that have incentive to impose uh, trade restrictions, monopolization of a market. Uh, the second connection that I would like to make at the theoretical level is the connection uh, with um, modern free trade agreement theory. So if you go and read the modern literature on free trade agreements, it's essentially mainly about solving uh, the incentive that countries have to increase their market power um, through tariff, okay? So the basic idea is the following. Two, imagine two trading uh, countries. One country is committed to free trade. Is it my best interest to also go and do free trade? Well, the idea is not. So the best I can do is to impose a tariff. The tariff allows me to manipulate the terms of trade in my favor, essentially I'm monopolizing my exports or behaving as a, monopoly, as a monopsonist with respect to the imports, okay? So of course, that that's not equilibrium. What trade theory says, well, both countries will be doing this. Both countries impose very high tariff, and then we end up with uh, a crappy equilibrium with a lot of protectionism that is not good for anybody. So what is a modern theory of trade agreement? It's, well, we acknowledge that bad equilibrium, and we sit on the bargaining table to discuss possible ways of reducing tariff in a mutually beneficial way. Yeah. So um, in our model, we wanted to shut down any of these, uh, of these arguments because we don't want to deal at the same time with a, color, a metropole imposing a restriction on a colony and a country having incentive by itself to manipulate terms of trade. So we put a model for the economy in which all these issues that are coming from free trade agreements are not present. So in this basic model, the best countries can do it's free trade and they don't have any incentive by themselves to impose trade restrictions on other countries, okay? But then you might wonder why on earth then you end up with an equilibrium in which you end up imposing trade restrictions. Well, there's a very important implicit assumption in the modern theory of a trade agreements is that you only control your own trade policy but you do not control the trade policy of others. While in a case in which you have uh, colonies, that's not the case. The metropoly can control the trade policy of the, of the colony and that's of course change completely the game. So the only reason in which we are obtaining trade restrictions and mercantilist policies in this game, it's not because of anything related to modern uh, trade agreement, a theory, it's because one country controls the trade policy of the other country. So in some sense, I think it's, this is interesting um, from the point of view of new um, uh, trade agreement theory, because it reveals an implicit assumption in the theory that maybe it's correct right now, but historically we should reconsider maybe. Okay. Um, Final thing, so uh, some kind of extra results or things that we discuss in the paper, and I think are, are, are potentially interesting. So we briefly discuss our potential solutions here. So as you see, everything is with uh, quotation marks. Essentially, we're not 100% sure about this. So uh, one way of thinking about how to solve these two inefficiencies is to decolonization. In this model, I'm thinking in the theory, if you don't have a colony, you go to free trade, it's optimal for everybody. Nobody has incentive to fight. So essentially you kill both inefficiency simultaneously, okay? On the other hand, if you eliminate the conflict technology or you make conflict more costly, less problematic, you may eliminate some of the pure rent seeking problem, but still the incentive to do uh, 
arbitrary restrictions are there. They do not disappear. So essentially what solves everything here is decolonization. Okay? So what happened historically? So why we, so why did the myths of mercantilist policies in the 19th century and then maybe uh, during the 20th century? So again, we discussed several hypotheses. One option is there was a change in technology. So now raw materials are less important. So colonies are less important. And that was the, the main driving force that eliminated um, uh, mercantilist policies. Another possibility is that essentially the British Empire won the war. And then until there was a new challenger, then, well, of course, if you don't have any challenger, you go to, you go to free trade within your empire. Uh, but then as soon as Germany and other countries are, appears as uh, new challengers, there was new colonial wars and imperialism in the 20th century. Okay? So this is everything very speculative, but at least the model points you in some, in some direction, okay? Um, finally, well, a couple of extra things. Um, maybe this idea of weak mercantilism, it's very difficult to enforce. So weak mercantilism means that you are trading with the other metropoly, but you don't allow your colony to trade with the other metropoly. That's maybe very difficult to monitor. What if uh, you cannot monitor that, so you are forced to go either to free trade or just build empire with no trade at all between the empire and the rest of the world? Well, in those cases, you can span some of the results. So one uh, metropoly may want to go to free trade. The other one may want to go to, um, uh, to uh, strong mercantilism. So in that scenario, it's even possible to get uh, free trade and peace as an equilibrium. It's possible to get free trade and peace depending on who wins the, uh, the colonial wars. So uh, the, the, the options that the model generates are, are, are much, more, um, um, much more interesting in some sense, but also uh, let's clear the exact prediction of the model. Something that is interesting if you think about um, the perspective of the, of the colony is that um, it's not clear for the colony uh, who should be the best metropoli. And then usually, essentially, historians should not discuss much this. But in our model, we have some ideas of which uh, is the metropoli that you want to have. If you cannot go to an independence process, if your only choice is that uh, support one metropoli or the other, essentially, it's not the same for the colony to be colonized by Metropoli 1 or Metropoli 2. There are some uh, differences there. And in particular, the key thing is um, the, um, uh, so the demands of your colonial inputs in one Metropoli or the other are not the same. So you want to be uh, the colony of the uh, Metropoli that demands the most your colonial input, okay? So that's, um, that's something uh, interesting to, to discuss. And then something that is work in progress right now. So we're extending this, this model. And then one interesting thing that you get is uh, when you add more periods in this game, so um, that essentially you may go to strong mercantilism rather than weak mercantilism, which is a more severe trade restriction, um, um, essentially because there is a connection between trade policy and war. So essentially something that could happen in this model is that if you're expecting war and you already control uh, a, a colony, you may want essentially to um, um, go to more severe uh, trade uh, policies in order to increase the gap between you and the other uh, metropoly in order to manipulate the winning probabilities of, of war. Okay. So I probably ran out of time. Uh, I have some other things to, to, to discuss, uh, but I think um, overall, uh, why should we care about, about this? I think from a historical perspective, I think it's interesting that connection between decolonization and trade liberalization, I think is interesting. And then the similar mechanisms can also be applied to um, uh, organized crime. Uh, so I think it's not only about colonial history. There are some stuff that is going on right now, and the, the, the similar mechanisms are, are at play. Okay. All right. Um, 
So I will keep a cue. I think the very first person was actually Mike McGinnis. Okay. So if, he is, if you want to, uh, uh, are you sharing your screen or is? Yeah. I'm sharing my screen. So sharing so that Mike can. Okay. Let me start um, that. You ready for me? Yes, we're ready for you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Gustavo. Always nice to see someone uh, taking a fair, fair, fairly narrow sort of focus on, what, three or 400 years of history, world history? That's not too bad. Uh, I had a colleague who uh, would always go to two or 3,000 years worth of history before he would do any models. But anyway, he's, uh, he's gone. So um, fascinating sort of model. Uh, I know a little bit about some of these models, uh, some of these approaches that you've talked about, the uh, uh, connections to um, democratic peace and uh, liberal sort of theories of trade leading to uh, supposedly leading to less conflict. But let me take a couple approaches. Let me start with one. I've got I've got a few, but let me start with this one. First, a clarification. So the wars, the 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 military expenditures of these countries, the the two core powers are are um, the two colonial powers are using our basic way to fight a war against each other uh, and not uh, to fight against the colony. Is that right? Correct, exactly. Yes, they are not fighting an insurrection in the colony. They are fighting for the, for the control of the colony, essentially. Yeah, see, that's, that's where, I, I think that's a good place to start, but I think to make it a little more realistic <clears throat> uh, or potentially be able to get you to attack a couple more questions and make a few more distinctions about what happens between different powers and stuff, is to realize that these colonies are kind of um, costly uh, uh, enterprises to keep running because there's usually some resistance of various kinds. And so at least part of the military expenditures are gonna be spent um, in um, controlling the colony and keeping it ready and making sure they don't trade with other countries. And so there's a lot of enforcement costs sort of involved in that too. So it's, it seems to me that there's not quite as clear a distinction between the, the use of the military force for conflict between the two imperial powers uh, and then the trade, which is apparently involving all three of the countries. I think that's what your, your model is sort of trying to design, that all three of the countries are pursuing at least um, a, a core part of economic logic, somewhat independent from the, uh, uh, the military force kind of argument. Uh, but it but it strikes me that there's there's a deeper sort of connection there is that some of the military forces are necessary in order to actually run the colonies themselves. Uh, and so there's kind of in in the system, there's a built in waste in the system in that if you're going to have a colonial system, you're going to be um, enforcing it militarily. Uh, and so that's going to give you some um, um, some some departures from efficiency there. Uh, like I said, I got a couple other directions I might go, but I'd like to hear sort of what your initial reaction to that is, is whether you could incorporate uh, the costliness of running a colony in your in your analysis. Good. So uh, that's an excellent point. So it's um, a couple of reactions as they come to my mind. So uh, we wanted to explicitly shut down some of those uh, of those paths because we wanted to be sure that essentially the mechanism was there even without those those issues okay mm -hmm. so but i again historically i totally agree with you that those internal um, mechanisms are, are in the colony are are important so um a couple of thoughts of how to go so one way of thinking is that um you have to subtract some uh military costs in order to run the colony and in that way, you can interpret these extra expenditures as the cost of uh, fighting to protect the colony from the other metropoli or to challenge the, the metropoli of another. But there are going to be some uh, initial, some basic costs that you will have to pay, some military costs, no matter what. So that will put you in the direction of, um, again, yes. So you can attribute some fraction of the of the military expenditures as just pure cost of running the colony rather than uh, challenging the other metropoli or defending, right? Um, but if those costs that you have to pay no matter what are really high, 
I can tell you what will happen. Nobody wants to fight for the colony, no? So essentially, if the colonies are so expensive that the, the, the monopoly rents that you are getting for manipulating the terms of trade are not good enough to pay for those military expenditures, essentially, the best for you is to do not fight. And indeed, I would say historically, if you find a colony like that, um, it might be the case that uh, if you think that your rival will suffer those problems, you let the rival have the colony. It's a cost that your rival will be uh, incurring if, if they go in that path, okay? So uh, one important thing uh, there is, uh, imagine that you introduce that, you have some, uh, some cost of, of, of running the colony, good. Uh, still, it's very important how we compute the benefit of winning the war, because uh, if you lose the war, it's not that essentially you just lose the right of imposing mercantilist policies, okay? Um, that in some sense would not be that advantageous. The problem is that the mercantilist policies of your rival are essentially exclusion of trade with the colony for you. So that could be very expensive, no? So imagine sugar colonies, no? So, okay, if you gain the right, if you control that colony, you impose some trade, trade restrictions, you gain some kind of monopoly prices for sugar. If you are the loser, you are excluded from that trade, okay? So it might be the case that even if you are thinking that it's costly to run this, uh, this metropoly, even if you think that the pure gains from manipulating terms of trade are not good enough to pay for those costs, still the comparative case with respect to the other scenario in which you, worth, you lose war, still good enough to fight the war, okay? So that's, that's I think, the, 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 the important thing. One connection connected with your comment, I think, could be useful. It's like the colony behave as just one player, no? So what if you have internal groups so different groups could ally with different metropolis, okay? We wanted to explicitly uh, shut down that path, but I think historically it's a very important one, okay? So e even think about the, the American Revolution. They were loyalists, okay? And they were, and they were uh, the revolutionaries. So essentially, you, you, you may think that uh, they were, again, that's a, that's a different thing because it's an independence uh, war, uh, but still, uh, you, you you get um, uh, some interesting connection between internal uh, politics and, and and external politics. The other one I think is very interesting is like internal conflict. So external conflict between the metropolis in some cases open the door for uh, uh, independence movement. That's that's pretty clear with Spanish America. So Napoleon invaded Spain, and that essentially opened the door or independence in, in, in Spanish America, okay? So essentially it's the fight of the colony, the fight of the metropolis, we open the door for a, um, a independence process in the colony, okay? So I totally agree there is a lot to, to, to explore in, 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 that, in that direction. Could, could I follow up on that, um, uh, uh, Jess? You're gonna allow oh, me yeah, to- Yeah, go for it, Mike. Because you, you, you um, that was a good that was a good response. I can tell you're sort of defending the simplicity of your assumptions and in, in order to be able to give you some I, I sympathize with that. I, I I've done that myself more than once. Um but um it 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 just doesn't strike me as quite the right picture of of what was going on in the colonial period. And I think that you were close to getting a clue there at, at the end of your response, uh, in that there are um factions within colonies that might align with different sort of approaches. But I think the really important thing is that there's more than one colony or more than one potential colony out there in the world. And the way this struggle between the great powers of the time were usually defined was a competition to capture more, a larger piece of the pie, if you will, like there was this yes. sort of pie out there. And especially since you're treating the, the colony as really not much of a strategic actor in, in your model. I mean, it's it's basically just reacting to the economic advantages of where it's going to go. So it's not really involved in anything about allocating military resources or imposing policies or anything. You could treat the rest of the world as this quasi-actor, 
uh, and and think about the the core powers, the core imperial powers, as using their military to compete to capture a larger share of the um, um, rest of the world's economy, and to get it then it becomes much more of a rent seeking sort of component in that you're you're trying to capture the colonies that the areas or parts that would be a big part of the of the economy. Uh, so you're going after the big the big uh, the big fruit rather than tackling the little countries. You're going after India rather than some small yes. part of Africa or something, you know. Uh, and uh, I think that that would provide a little bit better sort of representation of what was happening. And it might be able, it might help you sort of, so that basically you're not just, it's not that you're throwing the money away when you're trying to capture these colonies. You're investing in uh, capturing a part of the market okay uh and that that continues to be a cost and whatever but that uh you know that and there's going to be a differential in and for example one of the puzzles to explain is why did britain uh become to support free trade well you you hinted to it in your presentation when they had a lot of the colonies in the world they had the, the best colonial position it was in their advantage to sort of have free trade at least within the colony and to, to sort of limited in, in in that sense so you get different sort of equilibria conditions for the different core powers depending on how much money they've expended to join this colonial game and how much they've been successful uh, and how unsuccessful they've been and what strategy they force so they could even have strategies to um uh you know not try to remain a great power but simply try to do economic sorts of things so i think that's really more the white direction I wanted to go in trying to suggest you make this a little more realistic is thinking about not having a single colony that they're fighting over, but this whole big pie of potential colonies. So um, 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 if you could react to that, then I'll uh, I'll shut up and let other people make some comments. Yeah, just should, should I go for it? Yeah, just very brief. I, I totally agree with you, Mike. And then uh, in some sense, having one colony uh, I would say make things worse because imagine that we are talking about sugar colonies, okay? So if you if you just talking about one, if you do not uh, win the fight, uh, essentially you need to whatever produce uh, sugar domestically or go for a very very bad substitute, no? But if they can divide the pie and then you get some fraction of the sugar colonies and their rival get others, it, that makes um, essentially your incentive to fight. Uh, kind of less uh, less important, no? Because it's not that bad losing, okay? So what what I'm saying is that um, I I totally agree, but maybe what we are getting if we if we move in that direction, it's I would expect uh, less inefficient outcomes rather than the more uh, uh, than the more inefficient outcomes because that will give you the possibilities of of, of um, essentially substitutes, no? Unless you are targeting where to fight, so essentially you target to monopolize specific commodities, which I think the Portuguese tried originally, well, they, they all try, okay? In that case, it might be that you concentrate your fighting power in some specific colonies, because essentially your goal is to, as much as possible, to monopolize the war supply of that commodity. Okay, so I think there is there is room to improve in that uh, in that direction. Thanks. Um, so uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, how would it change that uh, calculation uh, if we look at it a bit? As I understand, uh, you are looking at now is like. You have a country or a political entity who, who has an army and has trade. Um, but uh, if if we're looking at the history of the uh, colonization, the, the trading company themselves has has a big role. So the East India Company had its had, had its own army, which was double the size of the British army, and it was have making treaties and fighting wars. So um, and. And if if you look at the trading company as the one who initiates further colonization and uh, uh, and and the so forth, the company might have different calculations because uh, they didn't pay for the British army um, 
and they don't care about foreign relations uh, issues that the British government does. They only do trade. Yes. So I, I totally agree. So I think uh, the, the interesting thing about trading companies is that the, the connection with manipulations of terms, terms of trade is pretty clear because that was in some sense the explicit goal of having those trading companies that were monopolizing pieces of, of international trade. So in that sense, we should mention more in the paper because it's like it's, it's, it's a good fit with, uh, with our story. But I totally agree with you that essentially you may have um, conflict of interest within the metropole. Okay, so essentially the interest of the uh, Great Britain in general is not the same as the interest of the um, um, uh, East India Company. Okay, so essentially the 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 the, uh, the um, these trading companies and the countries uh, they they may have uh, different uh, different goals. Okay, so probably I'm oversimplifying uh, historical discussions, but I. I believe that essentially there are two ways historians have been uh, thinking about um, uh, colonial brands, okay? And then one way of thinking is that it's clear that there was a, an elite within the metropolis that were winning, but the overall countries were not winning. So essentially the cost of running those metropolis was so bad that essentially some uh, elite, commercial elites were essentially ripping off the, all the benefits, and then for the rest of the of the countries, they were essentially fighting this uh, this endless um, um, uh, colonial wars. So it was not a good idea. Okay, and then the the, the second hypothesis, like well, no, no, it's the, there were some policies that the countries implemented, either getting directly access to resources or something in the direction of what we say is like manipulation of games of, of trade that overall the country was, was winning, okay? Um, I would say that historical uh, cases were probably, both things were happening at the same time. So this manipulation of games of trade give you uh, a path for the metropolis to win overall, but then those gains could be distributed in very unequal ways within the, the metropolis, okay? Um, so um, I, I agree that so Mike was pushing me to unpack internal conflict within the colony. Uh, I read your comments, hey, Gustavo, go and unpack conflict of interest within the metropolis. Not everybody wanted the same thing within the, uh, within the, within the metropolis. And I, I agree. So I would say in that case is that the, the key commercial elites and those trading companies, they have a huge incentive in, uh, in uh, imposing um, Trade restrictions that would manipulate the terms of trade, uh, but I totally agree with you that they were not fully internalizing the uh, army cost. So the cost of those wars that they were uh, essentially uh, generating. Okay, if that's the case, I would say, well, somehow in a cheap way I can handle that. It's kind of equivalent of having uh, cheaper guns in our model, something like that. Oh, um, but again, it's the best I can do in a model in which I am not distinguishing different groups within the metropolis. But if you distinguish, it's, I think, again, it's easy to extend the model. I would say everybody's paying part of the, of building the army and the Navy, but only some group of the, within the metropolis, it's, um, uh, it's gaining those, uh, those um, monopoly rents from um, from from trade manipulation. Okay, one important thing there. It's um, methodological note um, because we wanted to stay as close as possible to modern uh, uh, free trade uh, negotiation, free trade agreements literature, um, because we didn't want to deal with the model in which you have monopoly power at the firm level. We have a Ricardian economy, so essentially at the economic level there is free trade. There, there is, sorry, perfect competition. So there are no profits, okay? Anyway, in even in those cases, you can, through trade restrictions, improve the terms of trade in your favor, okay? It would be equivalent to, I'm boosting the trade of my export, the price of my export. I'm artificially decreasing the price of my imports. I'm doing that with trade policy, but any company in particular, it's not collecting profits, okay? Any company, it's essentially, it's, a, it's, it's in perfect competition and they're constantly trying to scale, there's no profits, okay? If you want to go in the direction that you are suggesting probably 
you need to impose, you need to introduce some kind of monopoly power at the economic level, and let's see how that monopoly power at the economic level and uh, trade policy interact, and then open the door for different coalitions within, within the metropolis, which again, I agree, it would be, it could be interesting, and we can open a discussion with historians discussing about are countries or commercial elites the winners from colonial um, from colonial restrictions, no? uh, which I think it's it's not a settled debate in in, in economic history at the very least. Okay? But also, so like, uh, is is it like a case of wagging the dog? I mean, was it the UK that 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 that, that was pushing, or was it the the company that was pushing, uh, or the Hudson Bay Company in Canada who was pushing? Who? Yes, I I totally agree that at the very least there was uh, one um, sorts of inefficiency there in the sense that they were not fully taking into account the, the, the army and navy cost. And that pushing, so if somebody subsidizes in a fraction of my, of my conflict cost, of course I'm more prone to go to conflict, okay? So, and I think that was part of the issue with the, with the trading companies. And also, that also probably explained why the governments start saying, well, decentralize those armies. Well, you should have your own army, okay? You will be internalizing the cost of, of, of the army uh, with potentially other problems because of that. But, uh, but, but again, it, in some sense, explains why government went in that direction. No? So I have yes. some questions uh, that are... Some are better formulated than, than others, so I apologize okay. in advance. Um, you, you sort of later in the paper, you sort of dig into like particular examples, sort of. Um, it would be helpful to see these different um, trade policies in action early on. If you can outline sort of, you know, weak mercantilism, free trade and strong mercantilism, mm -hmm. um, that would be, to me, really helpful in sort of like, okay, this is the variation that the model is going to help us explain. Mm -hmm. And I say that because um, what I kind of got from your paper changed between the paper and the presentation. And um, some of that's because, you know, as someone I, I, I know once said, we mean, reading formal model papers is not actually hammock reading. You need to like sort of mm -hmm. sit down and really unpack them. And so, um, and so it's uncommon to get something different right out of, the, out of the presentation. But I do think that would go a long way to answering the Skiplupia question, which is why do you need a model? Yes. Right. Um, and and in part because some some of this appears counter is a counterintuitive, but not that much of it, frankly, from mm -hmm. the way that you have suggested. And so I think early on. Um, it would be helpful to say it is surprising that we see these different trade regimes um, and we can tie them very clearly and logically consistently to um, conflict okay. right? um, and in the way that I'm going to explain in this model, um, in part because then you can sort of set out and say, OK, you know, formal models do different things. Obviously, you're well aware of that. Right. And it could be that they are providing results that you didn't otherwise see, comparative statics, et cetera, that are surprising. Could be that they're naming the parts in ways that we haven't yet before, right? And if, if that's what it's doing, then it's almost like a theory of the firm kind of thing. Actually, what is what is internal versus what is external, like, right? How much of a decision about trade policy is um, sort of uh, keeping the keeping the colony outside of the sort of unit, uh, metropolis unit as opposed to sort of bringing it in, right? Does that make it fully dependent, almost sort of reducing transaction costs in some weird way, right? That's almost that's sort of what it was making me think. Again, that's only if your model's goal is to sort of say, we're naming these parts in this particular way to show how they interact. Um, alternatively, right, it could be sort of explaining something which you are seem to be doing, right? Which is, and so, um, so some of that is just, uh, I think, in, in sort of um, thinking through how to, um, how to sort of present clearly the emphasis of what the model is and is doing. Okay. I think that would be super, super helpful um, as well. Um, and, and then, and sort of, you know, I, I, you know, I was especially interested when you're talking about like sort of the U.S. and we have all sorts of reasons and talk about how, how many different ways in which the CIA has installed puppet regimes across around the world. Everybody always loves reading about that. Um, 
But you have a really interesting, useful example, or like sort of unpacking of why that's the case. And so uh, sort of more of that kind of early on, I think would be um, super helpful. Do you have any examples where um, colonies retain their own trade policy? Um, I Nothing comes to my mind. So it's um, the, um, so in most cases, that was kind of one key thing that the metropolis. So yeah. you have, I think, cases which you are not controlling anything except trade policy. It makes them a colony, essentially. Yeah, so, to some extent, from my perspective, it's, okay. it's, it's mainly that. So, okay. so it's, um, again, well, so you have some cases, especially originally, in which there was kind of pure resource extraction, okay? And that I think is mainly related to um, uh, trade costs. So you, the trade costs were so, so high. Navigation uh, costs were, so shipping costs were so high, that essentially only things that are highly valuable per unit of weight and volume can be, uh, 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 can be uh, ship from America to Europe, for example. Okay, so that explains like you know, gold, silver, it's not rubber. Um, that's that probably relatively late. In the process. So that was eighteen eighties. So, so is that okay? So that's a good. So okay. So yes. So essentially, I, I I think that you 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 always observe cases in which they are they were trying to do something with the trade policy. Um, so, for example. Think about the, the US navigation acts were essentially that. Okay, so it's a, um, um, there are some extreme cases on the Spanish uh, empire. Um, there were uh, only uh, um, uh, some shipping routes that were allowed, uh, and then there are only some number of ships allowed to keep ports. So essentially, they, they all, I think the main variation was uh, due to enforcement and monitoring costs rather than what exactly they were trying to implement. And what they were trying to implement was pretty much what we captured with this uh, weak or strong mercantilism is essentially what I want is that uh, I am the only um, buyer, so I, or I am the only seller in the colony. And then again, sometimes it's impossible to control smuggling. Sometimes this means that I should be uh, monopolizing some trade routes. Sometimes it means uh, it, there were a lot of variations, but the, 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 the final goal was, was pretty much uh, the, the, the same, okay? Um, so, um, but I totally agree with you that maybe clarifying exactly what we, what we meant. Uh, let me give you an example that I think probably it's very inside the paper, it's not clear for the reader. It's that um, some people have this idea that empires, are, um, are relatively good because you are allowing free trade within the empire. But indeed, in our definition, that's the worst possible uh, trade policy. Because essentially you are allowing free trade within your empire, but you're not allowing any trade flow between the empire and groups outside the empire. Weak mercantilism, it's something weaker than that. So you are not allowing your colony to trade with the other metropolis, but you keep trading with other metropolis. And then I think that was the case. So uh, Great Britain and France, they were trading. So, but they were severely restricting trade of their colonies with the other. So essentially that is kind of a almost, if you're thinking of what is my optimal um, um, trade restrictions, that one is the best one. The problem is that sometimes it's really difficult to implement. And the reason I believe it's very, very difficult to implement is you need to really monitor those trade flows because there is a ship coming from America, okay? If that shipment is going to Great Britain, that's okay. It's allowable and it's free trade. But if it's going, then stopping a port in Great Britain and then go to continental Europe, that is not allowed. But there are some shipments of goods, like French goods, and British goods that are allowed. So essentially, you need to really control what is the shipment in each, in each case. Mike's question a little bit, which is it seems like the relevant variation or a lot of the relevant variation yes. comes from character. Even if the colony is not going to be a strategic actor, yes. there it seems, as you bring up monitoring enforcement costs, I, you, all, you also keep talking about sugar, which yes. is a particular kind of commodity relative to gold and yes. silver. Yes. Um, and we think about like the Spice Islands, right? There's you know, yes. then I'm starting to ask Robinson and extractive colonies and there, there we are. But um, 
but I guess one question is, is sort of, you know, does it make sense to think about um, the, the next iteration or sort of moving ahead? I, I don't know that you need to, I, I don't think that you need to make the, the colony strategic, but I am wondering if there's some relevant and useful, interesting variation in yes. transportation costs, which are related to monitoring enforcement. Right. And then value, relative value of the commodity, you sort of just have, if I recall correctly, it's just sort of like each each actor has a comparative advantage in one. Yes. Right. And that's the thing in the in the colonies comparative advantage is the thing that the metropole is essentially fighting to get hold of, pretty much. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So um so coming back to a strategic or whatever, some decision for the colony that here is kind of a pure passive player. I don't think there should be. I think I think okay. variation in in sort of environmental characteristic of the not environment, but um contextual characteristic or essentially some, you know, cost of monitor enforcement, essentially some costs associated either with maintaining the colony or with mon monitoring the trade and enforcement. Okay, so yeah, so essentially when you are picking your trade policy. Correct me if I'm wrong how I'm interpreting this. It's that, uh, but you need to take into account some monitoring costs of implementing your 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 trade your trade restrictions, okay, including the possibility if you are too severe, you may potentially face a rebellion or well, something like that. So that would be, that would be definitely that was gonna be my next direction, but um, yes. potentially. Um, yes, I then, think. I mean, then you just have way too many moving parts. Yes. So again. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit more, given that people ask about this. It's like, in some sense, it's part of a, of a uh, larger agenda on essentially thinking about uh, connections between internal conflict and external conflict seriously, okay? So I wrote a paper, I think I presented at the Austin Workshop several years ago on the American Revolution. And then there, it was essentially all the, uh, the colonies were kind of a key strategic players, but then they were, um, uh, coalitions in the metropolis, and then they have to come up with different uh, uh, arrangements between the American revolutionists and the and different coalitions in Great, in Great Britain. Okay, so um, essentially, I, I totally agree with this idea that um, the, at the end, what we want is conflict of interest in both places and external conflict too. Um, and this is part of an, an effort in. So cutting some strategic links to make it manageable. No, and, and I, I totally agree that it's there's need to keep keep thinking in that. And I, I, it's yeah, and I totally you know, parsimony, right? Particularly at some point, right? With formal models, you just add everything in. Yes. There's there's nothing left to explain, right? Um, I just I do think that some of the things in your conversation you keep coming back to yes. are not as present in the paper, and so the question is: Is the next iteration of the model focus more on those things? Um, if you think that this one is sufficiently like fertile in terms of yes, I, I I totally agree. And then it's like there are two ways of going. So one way it's essentially keep thinking about extensions within the same framework. The other option would say, well, let's go full monkey on this, and then let's think about the connection between dependence processes, processes and 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 a metropolis colonial worlds essentially, because I think that that connection has not been fully. Uh, understood, but I think that's definitely for a different project. So maybe not even a paper, more <laughs> more like a book. Um, uh, but I I totally agree that. They, so pretty much every independence process, I think it, the 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 role of external um, uh, conflict was was important. So it was really important. Okay, I sort of monopolized that because there were not many other questions that I could see, and we are now at one o'clock. But um, or at least according to this, we're at one o'clock. I think that's slow. Um, so if there are any, geez, anything you want to say to wrap up? Oh, sorry. To a, a closing, a, very, a historical look is what you're, what you view uh, this as historical. And I'd like to think about so how does this work in today's world? That might be a good closing. I was going there. You, <laughs> so if I have 30 seconds, I think I can share my screen and then go. Can I do that? So let me share. Oh, I want to share. So you got put up on the screen? Yeah, very. So because it's also connected with my work with Ivan Lopez Cruz on organized crime. Okay. So you may think that essentially cartels are fighting for the right to monopolize a market, but in that case, it's an illegal product. And then 
if they monopolize some markets, okay, let's say a city monopolize the, 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 the um, distribution of, of illegal drugs, maybe that's not a bad thing because they have incentives to increase prices and reduce quantity, okay? So from that perspective, this works in a very different way. So that inefficiency, that second inefficiency, maybe it's something that we want to welcome. Of course, we don't want the violence. But something that we are discovering in this uh, uh, work with uh, Ivan Lopez Cruz is that, for example, Mexican cartels are yeah. also diversifying their operations to legal products, okay? And that's very different because they also want to monopolize. And then there you have both sources of inefficiency, okay? So you have, they are fighting with a lot of uh, bad violence going on. And, it's, and on top of that, when they are successful, one wins, and then they start monopolizing local markets of whatever, avocados. So that, that's costly, okay? You want to have competition for avocados, not the monopoly, okay? So essentially, there are some, some interesting things there, uh, in, I think, in real life. And overall, historical, but not that far away, I think it's useful Maybe to reconsider this discussion on trade opening after World War II and decolonization. So our paper says, hey, maybe it's not that we set up these good institutions to discuss trade and come up with trade agreements. Maybe we are able to do that because first we committed to decolonize the world, and then that reduced a lot the incentives to mercantilist policies to begin with. So essentially, that did another reading on trade liberalization in the post Second World War period. That's another uh, uh, take on this, okay? Um, I think that's, that's a good way of finishing, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Lunch, any other 